Welcome. I assume by now you all know where you are. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about some engagement community issues, but first, if I can find my uh, notes here, we're going to just meet, I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes version of who these lovely people are, because I'm assuming you did a little homework or this is enough to know at this point. You can always look it up later. <clears throat> okay, whoops. All right, well, I'm going to start with Robin because I know Robin, and full disclosure, I'm in Reboot, and she's the head of Reboot. So, truth be told, uh, I should, you know, play my biases right away. Robin, um, here's the salient point about Robin to me. Not only is she a great leader of Reboot, but in terms of her background, she was like the first woman chief of staff for LA, for two mayors of LA, okay? That's like the key. But set aside Reboot to me, that's the key thing to know about Robin. Um, and what else do I know about Robin? She was on many other foundations, including the Broad Foundation, which I assume that means you've already seen the new museum. I don't know. Yeah, yeah okay, great, awesome. And other boards, Pfizer, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so let's go down the line here. Um, we have Jody, and she was, she's here from Boston, and she is also the interfaith person. She's gonna be speaking about that. She is, here's the key thing that I learned. I mean, she's a lawyer. She has this great background in engagement and advocating. The key thing to know about her is she's a Yankees fan. Okay, so everyone here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever. We're out of it now, but whatever. Okay, so lastly, we have Ray, and Ray wears two hats. Ray is on the board of Burning Man, and no, uh, yeah, she can, uh, and she's also on, works for Airbnb in a philanthropic role there. Um, let's see, what else do I need to know about her? I mean, the words that come to mind here are, she was a, she was a philanthropic advisor at the Rockefeller Philanthropy, she knows about impact investing, volunteerism, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so everybody has kind of a grip on who's here. Okay. I thought tonight that I would start the conversation off and then we'll let them go from there. I am struck by the, the title tonight, which is a word that I hear all the time, which is this word about community. And I hear that word now everywhere. So exploring meaning, engagement, and community in the 21st century. What does that mean? Where, where, why is community like the word that everybody goes to now everywhere when you want to sell something? It's not just in religion. <clears throat> My, I looked up the definition. Definition is basically a group of any side who reside in a specific locality and have a common cultural and historical heritage. In my mind, that's a ghetto. So where do we get this idea of community? After World War II, and everybody settled here, and we settled in our little ghettos. We, we stuck together, we built our lives, people were able to be Jewish, and start being able to be comfortable with being Jewish in a society that accepted them. After the war, there was still this level of fear. You were, you, know, you were supposed to go to temple, you were supposed to give to Israel. All these things were put upon you because you were the survivors. Today, in the post-World War II that we live in, things have shifted, and really, we've assimilated. We're the most successful diaspora, you could say, um, <clears throat> or one of the most successful diasporas. We've already intermarried. We've already like changed. Maybe we go to temple, maybe we don't. We've ch shifted the playing field, because now three generations later, community means something else. Everybody has many communities, many identities. There's a thought in my mind that community almost is meaningless now, because as I said, everyone uses it to communicate everything or sell you something. So what I want to start off with tonight is, what does community mean anymore? Where is, is, am I wrong? I mean, is there still a place for it? I know people want meaning in their lives, and I know in the old days you would go to temple, and now meaning in your life may or may not mean going to temple. It may mean going to yoga. It may mean going to urban Adama. So I'm going to start with you guys, and, and Ray, because I know you wear two hats, but I want to be specific. Talk to us about Burning Man. Why is that so, so successful and so impactful? What, 
I know people refer to that as a community. So tell us a little bit about whether you agree with me or not, and, and what can we learn as, as you're sort of the non-secular, secular, the secular hat here. So tell us what can the rest of us learn from that. Can I first see a show of hands? Have any of you ever been to Burning Man? Raise your hand. Okay, a few. So you guys feel free to jump in, um, because the whole thing about Burning Man is that it is only about community. Um, and I, uh, I am wearing two hats, but the good thing about Airbnb and Burning Man, which is why I went to Airbnb, is that really the structures are the same. You set up um, a space for people to interact with each other, and then they bring all of the energy and passion and creativity to, to the space. And they interact with each other, and that's where the magic happens. So um, at Burning Man specifically, um, all that was there was a plot of land um, starting in 1990, a dry, flat lake bed in the middle of Nevada um, that didn't really even have streets and they had a few porta potties. And basically, it was nothing until people came in and made it what it was. And now, 30, almost 30 years since its um, founding, 70,000 people who come from all over the globe. Um, it's exactly the same. Now there are more streets and more rules and more law enforcement and more emergency services, but without the people who come, there would be nothing. It's not like any other festival where there are bands who are paid to come and perform. There's no exchange of money. Um, there's no, it's a gift economy, and so people come to the event and the whole point is to welcome people into their homes, sort of like Sukkot, welcome them in, and give them an experience that they're going to find really enjoyable. Tell me how that varies with the reboot experience, because there's a I connection. Think, yeah, I think this important point you made about people come and make it their own. People come. So the, the purpose of community, we're social animals, human beings. Uh, and uh, the purpose of community is to find our place and to be part of, a part of a place, figurative and, and literal. Uh, what we know from Reboot also is that in Jewish life, there really aren't enough invitations that are felt, that are warm and welcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and you all know the demographics. We, we work primarily with people in their 20s and 30s uh, who consider for the most part themselves to be Jewish, or they have a Jewish itch to scratch and are unsure how. Um, and by offering the opportunity to gather, to ask a Jewish question, anyone they want, uh, and to not feel stupid, to not be made to feel stupid because they don't know. As, as one rebooter, uh, Jill Soloway, would, would say, when, when I came to this thing, this group of Jewish people, creative, I didn't know the difference between Havdalah and Hadassah. And I do now, and it, and it matters. I do know, and it matters. So I think. That is, 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 those are the common, those are the common threads. So Jody, do people come to you because are they looking for religion specifically? Are they, what is their form of, what, what kind of community are they looking for when they come to you? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I, for us at Interfaith Family, I think this, this issue, this question of community and what does it mean to be a community is something that we're really, we're grappling with. And here's why is when folks come through our doors, they come um, because we are a welcoming place for them to uh, engage in Jewish life, right? They don't know what they want. Uh, they may not know exactly how they want to engage. They may have had negative experiences in the Jewish community previously or no experience in the Jewish community previously. And when they connect with Michael Copeland, our rabbi here in the Bay Area or her counterparts around the country, they come and they might have questions. It might be a, a particular touch point at their uh, in their life, they might be getting married or have another life cycle event and come through our Jewish clergy officiation referral service. And when they do, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. And so for us, it's about creating first a, and a relationship between our staff and that person who's come through the door. And then the second piece of what's happened for us, and this has been a surprise, we're fairly, the Your Community Initiative, which is here in the Bay Area and around the country, is, is a fairly new program for us. The oldest community has, has been in existence 20, since 2011. And one of the things that we found, we just did our first pilot evaluation with Rosoff Consulting, one of our communities in Philadelphia, who's, who's been around since 2012. 
And one of the things that came out of that pilot evaluation was this notion that interfaith couples and families, they want to meet other interfaith couples and families like them. That that's, they want to have someone that they have shared experiences with. They want community. And for us, this has been a transformative um, aha moment because they've taken, we've taken that evaluation and, uh, and basically taken the next step to transform our theory of change and our logic model that goes with it because of this notion that interfaith families and couples, which we initially thought of ourselves as, uh, as almost a pass-through entity, that we connected with interfaith families and couples, provided a supportive environment, and then connected them with organizations and professionals in the Jewish community that would make sense where they could have authentic, meaningful uh, relationships and experiences. And instead, we've said, oh, you know what? Interfaith couples and families, they want to meet with each other, right? And they want to build their confidence and their knowledge base in a peer group. And so for that, for us, it's been, uh, that has been a transformative moment for us. Do you guys think, and I'll open it up to whoever wants to answer, is it important for community to have a physical space? Can it be fluid? I mean, a community could be on your phone. What, what seems to be working for you guys in terms of like bringing people together about the space part of it? I would say one of the things, um, you know, I'm not of the reboot generation, a tiny bit older, but one of the things that I've learned, a tiny bit, one of the things I've learned is that I think because Reboot was created 14 years ago by people that were already digital mavens, feel very comfortable in that sweet space between the digital and the analog or the real. And using the digital as a tool, as a gathering spot, but also as a trampoline to be in person. I, I, think, I think there so are- So using both. Both. <laughs> both, but not to mistake, not to, I hear often in, uh, I'm from Los Angeles, a Dodger fan. I'm very happy to be here. Just saying. I feel very welcome. I feel very welcome. Uh, but I will say in Los Angeles, when I'm around many Jewish communal organizations, they ask us, well, how do you use digital? We've added the digital and the Facebook. No, it's an add-on. To me, in our experience with the folks we're trying to work with, it's part of the toolkit of how folks connect and relate. But in general, there is a desire to be in person. There is, and in small, in small uh, gatherings, not all big, and a mix of ways. So I think it is fluid. So Ray, I know people go to this fairly barren place to create a, you know, a city of some kind for two weeks, and then they leave. There, there has to be something important about making something physical for that short period, because then the rest of the year, you know, that's it, right? Well, we have, um, we have dozens of regional groups all over the world that do their own events and gather together for communal effort in many different ways. Sometimes it's to fundraise, sometimes it's for community service, sometimes it's just to get together for fun. So there are people who feel like there are burners who have never been to the place in Nevada that everyone thinks of as Burning Man. Um, there are artists who have been funded by Burning Man who consider themselves burners, but have never, again, been onto the desert floor. But it is... Absolutely, sort of, I hate to use the analogy, but sort of like the Mecca. It's like everyone goes there to get recharged, to get re-inspired, and then takes that back into their communities. But we have communities in South Africa, we have communities in Australia, we have communities in Japan, and they all physically gather together um, as well. Is there something in the Burning Man experience that's Jewish, or is it better to not be, you know, to, is, is that an important badge or no? Well, we have 10 principles for Burning Man, which I think are very much aligned, I mean, with my understanding of Jewish values, having grown up Jewish. Um, but, and there are communities of Jewish people who you know, were observant on the playa, who have Shabbat services on the playa. My sister's a rabbi and came back and did her Yom Kippur service about her experience at Burning Man. There's a temple where people are able to put their remembrances and then burn them. So there's a lot um, of spiritual aspects. And the thing about Burning Man is, again, it is whatever anyone wants to create it to be. So there are plenty of camps that are, are really observing Jewish life at Burning Man. I, I don't know that much about them, but maybe the people here can talk about how that plays itself out. I think in my observation, I find now that younger generations come to Judaism through different routes, like maybe Burning Man or, and I wanted to ask Jody, you know, 
yeah, you could call somebody and go, hey, do you know a rabbi? But now you can just look online, right? So what's the extra role that you play in making that pathway to, fig to helping people figure out whatever it is they want? Yeah, I think for us, it's really twofold. One, it's the piece where um, we're trusted advisors to interfaith families or couples who may not have an entry point into Jewish life. Right? So they come to our website and they have access to resources or they realize that there are lots of other families like them uh, who've had similar experiences, who um, have Christmas trees in their home that are purely cultural experiences, right? that don't have religious significance even though they've made uh, Jewish choices and chosen to raise their kids Jewish. Um, and I think that piece where they find that sense of community of other folks like them is really integral and along with it, um, access uh, to authentic, meaningful experiences and, and a way in is really key. Um, I will say, going back to the, to the community piece, the physical space is not as important in our minds as having that, that communal safe space where, where folks feel like I can be, uh, I can talk about my life as it is, not as someone might wish it to be. And so for us, one of the things that we've done uh, within the last year is we closed our Facebook group, uh, which had been an open forum. We closed it so that it, it didn't show up on, on friends' feeds. And one of the things that we found is that the conversation changed dramatically and that people started opening up and sharing with each other in a way uh, about the experiences that they had and the challenges they faced as being part of an interfaith couple or, in, or a child of an interfaith family or uh, their challenges within their communities that we didn't find um, when we had an open group. So that was one piece. And the second piece, though, is meeting in person has really been an integral, uh, an integral piece of the work that we do. When we started out, we had an online course um, through a platform called Moodle. And uh, the course was called Raising a Child with Judaism in Your Interfaith Family. Now, it's a mouthful, but it gets across the point, right? which is um, how you can infuse universal parenting concepts uh, with, with Jewish, basic Jewish experiences. If you want your kids to be calm before bedtime, you say the bedtime Shema. You want to teach your kids about food insecurity, you say the Motzi. And we had this online platform, and one of the things that we found is that folks wanted to meet in person, that they didn't want to meet just online, even though they were busy parents, they had lots to do. Uh, and so that, that having that space where they could talk about their experiences was a really key, key learning for us. So... I mean, how do you guys, and I'll open this up, how do you, when somebody does a program or gets invited to Reboot once or, you know, has one meeting or goes to Burning Man once, how do you get them to come back or to, to re-engage? How, how does that work? Well, our, our own strategy has changed because in the beginning, uh, Reboot was really uh, introverted. Folks that would be invited to this uh, intensive gathering would be asked to bring a Jewish question and to answer these three. Who am I? What have I inherited? And what, if anything, do I want to do about it? It's the, if anything, that has led to all the projects that we've created around unplugging and celebrating the 10 days of awe, usually through a cultural path, point of entry, not religious. Right. Um, and and the, way, the way that people become engaged is that they discover, they have an experience, they make friends, they create relationships. And then we, we use social media and other forms to keep folks engaged. And we work with more than 800 nonprofit organizations to share what we've learned. So they can, so there's a kind of ripple. Um, but the main point under all it is, you know, this is a human endeavor. And if we, don't, if we don't ask, and if we don't open, and if we don't welcome, the rest of it, no matter how great the content or anything else, doesn't mean much. Someone has to ask us and ask us again. And then we become askers and doers, I think. So we only have a few more minutes for this part, and then we're going to open it up to questions. And I kind of wanted to get the future question in there about if the world has moved and we're all assimilated in my mind and we're you know, we, we wear different hats, much like Ray in our lives. Um, what's the future like for your organizations? How do you move with it? How do you motivate people when, you know, just using the fear tactic that's been very prevalent 
in generations past doesn't really motivate people anymore, or the fear that Israel's going to go away, or whatever all the fear tactics are. How do you how do you move forward? I mean, for both Airbnb and for Burning Man, we talk a lot about tr transformative experiences, taking people out of their comfort zone, putting them into a place where they can feel safe and become their best self. And so that's addictive. You know, if you've, if you've gone through that kind of sort of hero's journey, whether it be uh, on the desert or by traveling and staying with someone that you don't know and understanding a new culture and getting rid of your biases, um, then you, you want to do it again. You want it more. You want to continue to be inspired to, to continue to grow. And so I think that's why both organizations that I'm affiliated with have been so successful. The people talk about being transformed by the experience of either becoming a local instead of a tourist in the places that they're traveling or going to the desert and realizing that they can be as creative and self-expressive um, as they'd like to be. Jody, what do you think for you, given you know the, the demographic changes going on in the world? I, I would say for us, the future is about showing the relevance and meaning of Jewish life for interfaith families and showing them why it matters and how um, that even if their partner or their spouse is someone of a different faith, that they have shared values and that you can pivot on those values uh, and that the community that comes up around those, uh, we all want our, our children to be good people and that there are ways in uh, by, by engaging in Jewish life. So to me, that's one, the, the second piece for us I think is really having um, explicit messages of welcome for interfaith families in Jewish life and that that matters and that it's not assumed and that interfaith families left to, to their own um, experiences will think that they are not welcome in Jewish life. And so if we want them to be welcome, we've, uh, we've got to say we want them there. Uh, and then we've got to back up uh, our message of welcome with our actions. And uh, you know, and, and, our, um, and the ways that we do that. I had a, a volunteer of ours um, tell me recently about the experience that she had in, uh, in the Bay Area. And she was involved in her synagogue. She's a Christian woman raising Jewish kids, uh, married to a Jewish husband. And, uh, and she was involved in the synagogue one evening and a bunch of people were sitting around talking. And they said to her, uh, they were, you know, Inter intermarriage is just dumbing down the Jewish gene pool. Thanks. Wow. I don't think we should end on that one. Ah. Right. Uh, and I think when you talk about community and when you talk about um, what it means to be welcome, uh, you've got to think about what you're saying uh, when you're in that community. Anything to add, Robin? Uh, well, whew. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, I would say from Reboot's perspective and my own personal is that hopeful. We are, we are, I, I'm very hopeful about the future. And the reason is Jewishness is full of these amazing treasures for how to live, inaccessible to many. And if we can figure out ways using culture, innovation, inventiveness, film, the credible things you do, uh, gatherings, online, books, experiences that take the old and make them new. I have seen the power of, of this. I, our work, all of it, these wonderful virtuous troublemakers, is to change lives. And so if we can offer experiences that give people the opportunity to make and have experiences of discovery and joy, um, then I'm very hopeful. I, I would say it this way. There was a Yom Kippur, uh, uh, repentance celebration here uh, in San Francisco. There was a repentance wall that was put up at the CJM, and a hundred and some young people in their 20s and 30s came to, in six words, say what they wanted to atone for. Six words. And uh, one, one, guy, one guy wrote, um, stop following Donald Trump on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> And a young woman wrote, missed my sister's chemotherapy appointment yesterday. OK. So what that made something very old, new, and relevant, and gave these people who didn't know each other, who weren't part of a community as they saw it, the making of a community. 
and a very deep discussion on the very essence of what, you know, of the alchet is about. So that's why I'm hopeful, because uh, we have in our, in, our, in our big gene pool, the human gene pool, um, a lot of inventiveness, a lot of creativity, and I also think that uh, people in their 20s and 30s, like all of us, are seeking for meaning and joy Definitely. and connection. Okay. Hmm? Okay, somewhere we have a microphone, no? And uh, I wanna know if any of you guys have questions. Let me just say, these are three fairly innovative things, and I wanna applaud you all for having this forum and being able to do what Jennifer said, which is support new ideas, support innovation, support new thinking, because there are different paths now to being Jewish and to wanting to connect or wanting to find that peace. And this is just the beginning. There's going to be more. Not everybody's going to walk through the door of a temple or a traditional thing. Those things are great, but we need to widen the net. And these are three ways that the net has been widened and probably three things we can all learn from. OK, who has questions? Anyone? Come on. Thank you for your, uh, my name is Paul Cohen. Thank you for your presentations. All three of you have spoken about a population that, shall we say, is probably under 40. Um, my concern is, what about those folks who are touched by not understanding how to do digitally, by grandchildren that may be brought up different than they are? How do each of you connect with people over 40. Well, f well first I want to um, say that Burning Man is absolutely multi-generational. There was someone here who said their father had been to Burning Man, but they hadn't been. So um, I think one of the really powerful things about Burning Man is that it, it brings together um, from newborns to people I've seen out there in their 80s, um, really, really in community in an authentic way, in a way that um, that age doesn't have to be a barrier. So um, I think, not surprised that people think that, but, um, but actually not the case. And actually Airbnb um, as well, um, I think about 25% of our hosts are over 65. So again, bringing together multi-generations. Anybody else want to crack at that one? Just very quickly, one of the great things that happens um, with people who are 20 and 30 and that magic sort of awakening to maybe a future and a family. Um, at least in my experience, many go talk to their parents and grandparents. And uh, we've invented some ways to do that in ways that are safe and fun, like over cooking uh, uh, and so on. But the main, the main point is that these kinds of ideas are not so much about age, they're about mindset, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> And I think for us at Interfaith Family, you know, our mission is really around supporting interfaith families exploring Jewish life. And that's, that's cradle to grave, right? And uh, at all points along the spectrum. And so um, while we have some specific programming for um, new interfaith couples and for families with young children, I think our, our programming, we really work to, um, to attract as wide a swath of the audience as we can. Uh, we have a new program called Hala and Conversation. People like to make Hala and have conversation. You know, people like to uh, connect with each other informally through our monthly meetups. And so I think having those available and open um, to, to everyone is really a key part. Yeah. You know, Paul, I, I think it's nice to be multi-generational, but actually the reason I, I think that the next generation is actually more important than we are. Uh -huh. We're already Jewish. Um, you know, we want to have Jewish grandchildren. So I think it's great that there's organizations that are appealing to the younger generation and appealing on the level uh, maybe that we can't connect to. So. <laughs> I have less of a question than a comment. In various parts of the country, I've met rebooters. They're no longer in their 20s and 30s. 
they, you have planted seeds all over this country, and they've blossomed into wonderful, innovative contributors to the community. So I think we're very fortunate to have yeah. Reboot and its graduates at all levels. <laughs> Adele? I knew you'd have a question. I knew it. I have a letter. I knew it. <laughs> Uh, well, this is, I think this is one of the great opportunities, by the way, for the future as well. Because if you were to Google cool Jewish stuff, you would <laughs> end up with like something called the Cool Jewish Guys Club, which, uh, by the way, doesn't exist anymore. Um, and and for, inter, for interfaith families, for interfaith families, I imagine that the, the at least for people, People know how to use the internet, right. but, to find, to, but to find Reboot in our own programs, you know, you kind of have to know where to look. That's what I'm and, and so one of the things we're honestly working on for our next chapter of invention is, what would it be like to have a, a, digital, a, a digital companion for a meaningful life lived Jewishly that brought together the very best of Jewish inventiveness, which I would say really is a thing going on at this time and really from my national perspective, has a vibrant sea here in San Francisco like nowhere else, and I mean that sincerely, what would it be like if we made it easier? Because the entities in Jewish life that do make it easy are Chabad and mm -hmm. Aish, and, and that's fantastic. They are welcoming and open organizations. But for many, that's not the path they'd like. This is something we, we do need to work on deeply. I think. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the answer that I want to hear, but <laughs> I think we probably all are. Um, I look at everything you're doing as, as finding Jewish meaning in, in, in what people are involved in. And in, in my experience, both in Hillel's and in, you know, day schools, and is that people who are involved in organizations like yours acquire suddenly the understanding that these values they have, doing all these things that Urban Adamad does, for instance, are Jewish values, and they didn't know it. And what I'd like to know is if you're finding people are then finding pride in being Jewish because the values that they have, they suddenly know where they're from. I, I would say from, and happy to share with you the, the results of a, of a bit of research that we just completed. Yes, yeah, so you think about it, in, in our case, the, the group of folks who come mostly from the edge to Jewish life, who have felt judged, mm -hmm. who have felt less mm -hmm. than, who have heard these things, some of whom were, by the way, observant and Orthodox and left. Um, but when they have an experience and come to see that a Sabbath, a, a true story, one guy says to the other, this was a beautiful Shabbat, I've never had this before. You haven't? No, I mean, you go to an Ivy League college? Yes. You never heard of the Sabbath being a gift of the Jewish people to the world? No. Did you ever read the Bible as literature? No. Have you ever heard of Abraham Joshua Heschel? No. Okay, but this was a great experience, right? Yes. This is a Jewish, yes. This is, this, is the, this is not the if only you knew more kind of way of Jewish life. It's the have the experience and come to discover that there is Jewish in it and it resonates and it's beautiful. That's, that's the way I think the approach is. That's, that is part of what the change is about. Tricky and nuanced and beautiful, I think. I think one step further, go, giving people the freedom to get their Jewish on in whatever way they'd like to, right? Yeah, you know, that it's okay to have, uh, for Shabbat, to have pizza and your wine or grape juice in our house in Dixie cups. And that's great, right? And it's, it's okay if you don't have challah to say the motzi over the pretzels you have in your house, right? That there are different ways um, to get your Jewish on, and that, that's a really key piece in, uh, 
in expressing your Jewish values is to do it in a way that's authentic and meaningful in your own life. And that that's really the key beyond, behind all of this is it doesn't, if you're just dialing it in, it, it's not gonna be an expression of your values. To, you've gotta really own it and in whatever way that makes sense. You know, for me, I sing Jewish songs that I learned in summer camp at Camp Harlem in Kunkeltown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I sing them to my four-year-old twin boys and that's how I get my Jewish on. Right, and, and they know Moda Ani, and, uh, and I think for that, that's, it's the meaning and the expression of our Jewish values in ways um, that carry through. Uh, I think one of the things about interfaith families is um, that it forces the spouse who is Jewish to think through what is, it import what is important about being Jewish. What do I want to communicate to my spouse or my partner of a different faith? What do I want to communicate to my children? What's important about the upbringing that I had, about the religion that I had? And I think that's one of, um, one of the most terrific points of interfaith families uh, is, is the opportunity to do that, to say, here's what has meaning in a way that I think Jewish-Jewish couples often don't have to um, push themselves to do. Okay, last question. Yes, sir. You guys are, are innovators in, in, all, in, 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 all, in all the areas you're working in. I'm just wondering, for those of us who are continuing to hold on to, um, to the traditions and the institutions like a temple, um, possibly like a JCC, I mean, as innovators, when you look at the future of Judaism, is, are some of these institutions that we, we grew up in, uh, my parents' group grew up in, are they the typewriter? And, and, and I'm just wondering what's your thoughts on what is the future of some of these institutions that used to be the center of Jewish life that I think a lot of us are still funding and we still want it to be part of Jewish life, but at the same time, is it, you know, as you guys look into the future, is it, are these the institutions that we should be continuing to water or, or not? Don't look at me, that was your question. Well, I, my own view is that every generation has the opportunity and the right to renew. And Judaism itself is fluid and, and therefore the places and spaces that are, that are shoals and that are JCCs, the ones that are vibrant, and some of them are right here in San Francisco that are models to the rest of the country, they have come to, they have come to do the things mm -hmm. we're talking about. They meet people where they live as right. human beings. They add Jewish to the equation. They're welcoming and warm. They try new things. They're willing to fail. They don't, they don't beat each other up for falling. They pick each other up and offer a combination, I think, of humor and head and heart in ways that are beautiful and meaningful and different. And that means trying new things. Um, I was at a reboot, worked with a congregation in DC, a very traditional congregation, and their idea of innovation was putting a coffee shop in their foyer. They did nothing else, and they thought that that would, you know, that people would come. Well, no one came. <laughs> No one came. It was How like, was the coffee? It was lousy. Yeah. So these are the, 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 the questions that we all have grappled with are the ones that fine and hopeful and diligent uh, you know, leaders of these important institutions and pillars in Jewish life, ha you know, they have to get their Jewish on too. That's, that's what I think. Well, thank you so much, um, and to you, Anne, as well. For <laughs> thank you for sharing not only of your mind, but, but also of your heart, and really, really putting out there some, some important truths for all of us to listen to. So much appreciated. Um, Rachel, did you want to do that right now? After, great. So when, I, when I'm in this place, in this space, I, I suddenly want to say the matovu. How goodly are your tents? Um, and you know what's really in my heart, as good as these tents are, is, is really what's behind these tents, which is Suzanne and Elliot 
and their family and their children because they're here for this reason. They open their hearts and their home and it's such a beautiful thing. Every time I'm here, I think about, about how and why you did that. Um, I also want to say uh, to Jen, who's, who's now skulking back there, come on. Um, the last time I tried to do this, she, she was absent at the moment. But I just want to acknowledge her, especially given the last question, especially given what it means to take an important institution at the helm and turn it. Um, and Jen really did that um, and really pointed in the direction that enables me and the rest of our team to really drive into this bright future that you guys are talking about. So I want to acknowledge you for that. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I always want to acknowledge uh, those who came before us and especially our, our past presidents of this institution because as Federation we wouldn't be here without them. There's two of them here tonight by my count, Adele Corvin and Ron Kaufman. It, it, we're so much richer for you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to close. With, uh, you started with a word about community. I'm going to close with a word about engagement. My word about engagement is continuity. You guys remember that word? Yeah, I see, I see Joel wincing a little bit. That's what we used to talk about, right? We used to say we have to ensure the continuity of the Jewish people. We were a traumatized people, and justifiably so after the war who worried about our survival. And so we talked about continuity in exactly those terms. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about what or why, it was about survive. And thank God we did, right? So thank God we did. And as Maslow moved up his hierarchy, so have we, from survival up to something close to meaning. And so when we get to meaning and we're grasping for meaning, I'm gonna amplify what you said, Robin, so beautifully, although I won't do it as beautifully, we find this gift of Judaism. Sometimes we forget the why, <laughs> because Judaism is a great gift. The texts, the teachings, the Torah, the history, and we want to share this gift. I think the people that are in this room tonight, if you want to express it a different way, is this is a gift we want to share, because it was magnificent for us, and we want it to be magnificent for others in the way that they experience it. And that's really, really important. So as a federation, and something that, that generally, again, kicked us in the direction of, we want to drive to that future of engagement in different ways. So much so that we are staking a goal of doubling engagement of Jews in this area over the next 10 years. So the first question you'll say, and nobody asked it tonight, but well, what is engagement? I'm guessing that, that the three erudite and experienced women up here have different definitions of what engagement is. And that's a really important question for us to grapple. I loved what you said about Robin about um, the nuance associated with the engagement of, of, of finding it on, on your own. And, and that's really what it is. We're not going to tell anybody what being Jewish is. We're going to help with our partners, including these here, identifying those magnificent ways of being Jewish and really irrigate and support that path to share this gift. So that's the direction we're heading in and we're really excited about it and we're excited that you're here and hope that you'll be supporting us and know that you'll be supporting us as we move ahead.